The order. The clerk will now proceed to read the title of the private bill set down for consideration. Bishop Stortford Cemetery Bill, Lords, report stage. No. Excellent. So the question is, the bill may be considered. As many of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to questions. Secretary of State for Business and Trade, Gerald Jones. Question one, Mr. Speaker. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I will answer question one and question six together. My department continues to help SMEs grow overseas and export to the world, especially this year, the year of the SME. Businesses can ex- um, access support services, including digital self serve offer, and a wide network of support, including trade advisors, export champions, the Export Academy, an international markets network, and the UK Export Finance. Last year, the UK Export Finance provided £6.5 billion to exporters of all sizes, with SMEs comprising a record 84% of those supported directly with a product. Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. SMEs in Merthyrville and Remney tell me of their frustrations around exporting goods, and now the government have scrapped the trade show programme, which was set up to support British businesses to attend events and to win overseas uh, orders. So, can the minister tell the House and indeed the thousands of businesses who rely upon this vital support when there will be a replacement? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. UK exports are actually up, are increasing, and they are up by £21 billion compared to current prices compared yeah. to 2023. And he, my, the honourable member, mentioned the UK trade show. It was indeed a pilot, and the, the programme didn't reel the successes that we thought it would do. Which is why we have other schemes in place, including the yeah. UK Export Academy, international trade advisors help to grow, and the export ser- support service as well. And in particular, focusing on Wales, we will soon be appointing a new international trade. Advisor to help SMEs too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Enfield North has uh, quite a lot of medium and small sized businesses, um, and we're very lucky in that. But the businesses are suffering with the cost of spiralling bills and no government um, support. So, can the minister, does the minister think it is a lack of government industrial strategy or the lack of individual support to our exporters that is holding, that is most holding our businesses back? Thank you, Mr Speaker. That's an extraordinary statement because within her constituency, the greatest level of exports are professional and business services, Ah. which are increasing not only within the EU but outside the EU too. That's the reality of the ground. So our strategy is working. UK exports were £859 billion in 2023. That's a figure that goes up not down, by £21 billion. And as I said earlier, the second biggest services, which she should be proud of, because it's in her constituency, is exporting services, which are, uh, have been increased at 54%, up from 48%. So there is good news, but we're keen, obviously, to do as much more as we can. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, the OBR said yesterday that exports, including from SMEs, will now fall even more than was expected this year that in each of the next three years, growth in exports will be less than 1%, and that other countries won't be hit the same way. There has been cuts in funding to help businesses start exporting. No deal with the US, no Diwali deal with India, no veterinary agreement with the EU to cut red tape and slash costs. So what does this minister think is the best explanation for the government's dismal performance on export so far? Mr Speaker, the best explanation is really looking at the data that the Honourable Member put out and obviously omitting the reality of what's happening internationally. The OBR also referenced in that very same report the sluggish growth in global economies, Mr Speaker, and mentioned that British goods and services will outperform, on average, G7 countries. Those are the facts on the ground. When it comes to exports, not only are we exporting into the EU but outside the EU too, where once again, as I referenced earlier, professional business services um, are increasing outside the EU by 19%. We have substantial programmes in place to help small and medium enterprises, and we're keen to learn and do as much more work as we can. And there'll be obviously far more work coming through as this is the year of the SME. Yeah. SMP spokesperson Richard Thompson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement has hit small and medium-sized exporters the hardest, as most don't individually have the capacity to deal with the additional bureaucracy and paperwork that's been created by that trade deal. Does the Minister recognise that the TCA has disproportionately damaged SMEs in this way and their competitiveness? And what support can the Government offer to support SMEs to recapture the market share that they've lost in Europe since then? 
Well, it hasn't really been a, a loss in the market share. We've talked about what's happening internationally. We are, appreciate that small and medium-sized enterprises may not have the resources that they need to export into these new markets, which is why we have the Export Academy, which is why we have international trade advisors, which is why we have Help to Grow, and the Export Support Service as well. We're also looking at what trade barriers we can break down, we can bust to make it even easier for SMEs to be able to access the, the new markets and the trade deals that are being secured by my Secretary of State as well. Yeah. Alice Cunningham, number two, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our commitment to the UK steel sector is clear. This Government is contributing up to £500 million in a joint investment with Tata Steel, and we are in talks with British Steel following our generous offers of support. We have delivered over £730 million in energy cost relief since 2013, and the British industry supercharger is coming soon. We have updated our procurement policy note to ensure that we are procuring more in the UK, and we are trying to do everything that we can to continue to support the steel sector. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. We're all disappointed that the government, having abandoned Teesside Steel several years ago, is now ready to give up on primary steel making in the UK and rely on recycled material utilising electric arc furnaces. I am, however, pleased to hear that Teesside is pencilled in for one of them, but not so pleased that there have been attempts locally to circumvent proper procedures to secure planning consent. Will the Minister look into that? But more importantly, will she confirm that the Government has a final copper bottomed agreement with the industry and the furnace will <coughs> definitely be built on Teesside? Um, Mr. Speaker, a number of the issues he raised are fundamentally local. We've worked very closely with the Mayor, Ben Houch, and he's done a remarkable amount of work for his part in the country. The reality is that the steel sector was placed in, a, in an area of uncertainty for quite some time. We were able to provide support for Tata, which has ensured that those steelworks continue at Port Talbot. We've provided the largest grants ever made available to steel, and we're now in conversations with British Steel too. That is what, that's what it means to have a long-term steel strategy is showing that steel making continues here in the UK. Craig Tress. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. On the 1st of February, the Government reaffirmed its commitment to all of the UK's 5.5 million small businesses with the creation of the new Small Business Council, which is looking at key areas in terms of improving business support, access to finance, support and advice, and breaking down barriers, include barriers to female entrepreneurship. Thank the Minister for that response. And as Chair of the APPG on Women and Enterprise, it's been fantastic to see the boom in uh, female led businesses over the last few years. But what we also now to see, uh, see now is some of those consider how they can grow. So, can the Minister set out how this new Small Business Council can help them to do that? Minister. Well, can I thank you for his question and for all he does for women in entrepreneurship and on the APPG in particular. He's worked on that for many years. The Small Business Council has members on it of excellent entrepreneurs like Emma Heal from Lucky Saint and Julian Poonan from Creative Nature, who will rely on for, uh, for expert advice. Uh, we also have the Investing Women Task Force, which has helped to increase the number of female entrepreneur businesses from 56,000 in 2018 to 150,000 in 2022. The investment women curved with 240 signatories. We are, we are keen to do more, keen to work alongside him to make sure the world of female entrepreneurship is as friendly as possible to female entrepreneurs. Mr Speaker, will the Minister ask the Small Business Council to wake up to the opportunities in the hydrogen sector, both in all the engineering that supplies that sector, not only in terms of the coming replacement of batteries and, and uh, all that transportation stuff, but the infrastructure in our country, great engineering, ready to go with hydrogen future. When will he get to wake, wake up to that opportunity? Well, I thank you for this question. I think we are working up to that. We've got great opportunities, he knows, in Teesside in hydrogen, in Yorkshire in terms of the Humber, in terms of the hydrogen cluster, something we're really keen to support as a government. I appreciate if he would offer his support as well. Yeah, yeah. Shadow Minister Russia Nora Alley. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The perfect storm of rising borrowing, rent and labour costs continuing to cripple businesses, with the UK Small Business Index falling 78 points last December, according to Zero Small Business Index, the lowest reading since the middle of the pandemic in August 2020. The Government has had 14 years to tackle the barriers facing SMEs. So can I ask the Minister what specifically the Small Business Council is going to do and what his, uh, he and ministers will do to halt the alarming trend of more businesses closing than opening. Yeah. 
Well, I, I'm sorry that she's so pessimistic about the world of business. We speak at events together many times, and she hears the mood in those audiences, which is far more positive than she sets out. Uh, we are doing many different. Uh, we are active in many areas, as she knows. I, I pointed out the event we both spoke at this week: access to finance, of course, support and advice, removing barriers. Access to finance has been a key one, of course, in terms of startup loans. A billion pounds of startup loans so, um, to 100,000 businesses. But if she listened to the budget yesterday. She will have heard the rise in the VAT threshold, the government, uh, the growth guarantee scheme. You know, many, uh, many opportunities for small businesses, and 200,000 more workers coming back into the workplace. Another barrier for businesses. Get with the programme. It's much more exciting than she thinks. Yeah. Little Richard. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Secretary of State. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions four and sixteen together. Israel remains a part of the FTA programme and negotiations continue. I had a productive meeting with Israel's Minister of Economy, Nir Barkat, last week in Abu Dhabi, where we discussed our existing trading relationship as well as how Israel is managing the challenges of working on an FTA while fighting a war. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Israel is facing immense challenges in its war with Hamas. But it's known around the world as a start-up nation thanks to its extraordinary tech sector, which Brits benefit from every day. Given the enormous opportunities with a, uh, with a bespoke, bespoke fr free trade agreement with Israel offers the UK, can my right honourable friend update the House as to what steps she is currently taking to advance negotiations? Secretary of State. Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend will be uh, pleased to know that uh, we recently held a virtual negotiating round uh, with Israel in February this year, focused primarily on services, so that's one of the things we're doing to move uh, the FTA forward, and we'll update Parliament shortly in the usual way via written ministerial statement. But she is right to highlight Israel's world-leading tech sector. It's why we want to modernise and upgrade our relations with Israel. Our current FTA was signed uh, in 1995. It's a rollover from the one we had with the EU, and technological collaboration, which Israel specialises in will be made easier through an enhanced FTA. Bob Blackman, not here. Alistair Carmichael. Can the Secretary of State give me some assurance that the free, any free trade agreement with Israel will not allow the importation of goods produced in uh, settlements on the West Bank? State. Yes, yes, I can give him uh, that assurance. And we're clear under our existing UK Israel trade and partnership agreement that Israeli goods originating from the State of Israel receive tariff uh, preferences. We also have a separate interim agreement with the uh, UK and the Palestinian Authority. But I, and I can confirm that this will continue to be the case with an upgraded FTA with Israel. We won't compromise on our long standing positions on the Middle East process throughout this negotiation, including with respect to settlements. Andrew Rosen. Uh, number five, Mr. Speaker. Easter. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. The United Kingdom has trade deals with 33 Commonwealth countries, and our new developing countries' trading scheme offers more generous tariffs, rules of origin and trading conditions to developing countries, including 19 Commonwealth countries. The UK-Australia FTA has seen sharp rises in many UK export sectors, including furniture tripling year-on-year year and car exports doubling. Meanwhile, of the 11 CPTPP parties, six are Commonwealth countries, which will give us new or improved access to those important markets. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I know that you, sir, will be celebrating Commonwealth Day on Monday with the raising of the Commonwealth flag. Can I ask the Minister, will he use this as an opportunity to expand our trading relations with the Commonwealth and look at the idea of a WTO-style organisation involving all of the Commonwealth countries, opt-in, opt-out. Is this a great opportunity, surely, to expand our trade with the, some of the most emerging uh, uh, economic uh, powerhouses of the world? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I thank my well, friend for that question. His commitment to the Commonwealth, and I could speak also as a constituency MP with a huge uh, Commonwealth diaspora in Chelsea and Fulham. So I totally understand his sympathies. I look forward to celebrating Commonwealth Day with him and others uh, next week. Um, he knows the Commonwealth doesn't make trade rules, nor is a trade agreement body like the GCC, EFTA or CPTPP. We think the better course at present is to ratify our CPTPP membership and to continue to have reduced tariffs under our developing country trading scheme. But, Mr. Dep Mr. Speaker, we're always open to new ideas at the Department of Business and Trade, and I'm happy to meet my honourable friend to discuss this further. 
Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister very much for a very positive response? Uh, for all of us, the Commonwealth is very important. The, the value of UK exports to the Commonwealth increased by 23% in cash terms uh, between 21 and 22, while the value of imports from the Commonwealth increased by some 30%. Very clearly, uh, we can benefit each other. How can we ensure that Northern Ireland companies can benefit fully from the, this enhanced trading partnership? Uh, well, the Speaker, of course, uh, Northern Ireland benefits uh, from all of our uh, free trade agreements, and I very much look forward to uh, putting the case uh, for Northern Irish uh, goods and services um, in the months ahead. Of course, we also have uh, economic partnership agreements with 27 Commonwealth countries, and we also have the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in October to look forward to uh, to make sure that uh, Northern Irish goods and services exports, as well as from the whole of the UK, take centre stage. Martin Bickers. Number seven, Mr. Speaker. So who stayed? Mr. Speaker, since we left the EU, we've used our new freedoms to secure free trade deals with 73 countries, including uh, EU partners that accounted for £1.1 trillion of UK trade in 2022. We simplified import tariffs to lower costs for businesses and households. We plan to remove over 50% of inherited EU regulations by 2026. Our reforms to employment laws could save UK businesses up to a billion pounds a year, ensuring the UK is the best place in the world to start up and grow a business. Martin Bickham. Um, I thank my right honourable friend for her reply. The port of Immingham in my constituency is measured by tonnage, the largest port in the country, with around uh, approaching 50 million tonnes of cargo e each year. It's also vital uh, part of the renewable energy sector. And uh, Immingham itself is surely an example that it's not only EU trade but worldwide trade that uh, is important to the UK. And if my right honourable friend was able to visit at some time, she would be able to see that for herself. Yeah, yeah. Stay. Uh, as ever, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is a great advocate for his Cleethorpes constituency, and he is right to point out that Immingham is indeed the number one port in terms of tonnage, and it is vital to our trade with the EU and the rest of the world. And if our diaries allow, uh, I or one of uh, my other ministers would be delighted to visit and see at first hand the vital role Immingham is playing in the transition to renewable energy. Yeah. In December, the British Chambers of Commerce found that a staggering 97% of surveyed businesses were continuing to face difficulties using the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And despite the TCA being introduced over three years ago, businesses are still struggling to deal with the added headache that these regulations have created. So, if after three years we see 97% of businesses still facing difficulties, can the Secretary of State tell me how many years it's anticipated it will take for these issues to be resolved? Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. First of all, uh, what I would say is that many of the issues which businesses have been raising with us are not specific to this TCA, but specific to member countries, and this is why ministers and I, including officials, go to all of these countries and we remove many of these market access barriers which are not specific to the TCA. She will know that the TCA will be up for review. If she has specific things that she would like to mention that she wants us to take to EU trade commissioners, we're very happy to do so. Yeah. Um, Shadow Minister Tam Singh Desi. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This week, the Financial Times reported the most significant decline in UK trade volumes since 1997. It is clearer than ever that this government's hard Brexit policy has exacerbated challenges for British businesses, with a 7.4% drop in trade since 2018, with exports down by 12.4%, starkly lagging behind our G7 peers. So can the Secretary of State explain how 14 years of Conservative rule have prepared British businesses for their despairs around extra red tape and the chaos unleashed by this Tory hard Brexit policy? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman has just time travelled from 2018-2019. It's been a long time since I heard the phrase uh, a hard Brexit. He will, of course, know that we left the European Union with a deal, so he needs to catch up with, he needs to catch up with, with what actually happened. It's also interesting that he mentioned uh, the FT report from 1997. I will also let him know that we haven't been in government since 1997. We've been in government since 2010. And many of the things which he is pointing out are things which we have said will occur 
uh, as we see trade flows moving away from the European Union to the Indo-Pacific. That is why we have left. That is why we're trading with the rest of the world. He should also know that our economy is 80 per cent services, so most of the things which he is talking about are actually not going to impact the vast majority of the economy. Services exports are booming, and we are doing well since leaving the EU. Number, uh, number eight, sir. Mr Speaker, we have excellent relations with South Korea, as my uh, right hon. Friend knows as, as the Prime Minister's trade envoy there, and bilateral trade totaled £16 billion in the 12 months to September 2023. Negotiations to upgrade our FTA with South Korea were launched as part of President Yoon's state visit in November. Round one of the talks has already taken place, and round two will take place later this month here in London. So John Whittingdale. Um, on Tuesday, uh, in my capacity as trade envoy, I attended the signing of a memorandum of understanding in the Korean Embassy for the joint development of a small modular nuclear reactor. Uh, just one area in which the business between our two countries is growing ever stronger. So, will my right, will my honourable friend press ahead with the enhanced free trade agreement, which will offer? Huge opportunities to build on the existing £17 billion trade relationship. Uh, well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right, and the UK, of course, we've got our own uh, superb uh, Rolls Royce model for uh, a small modular reactor as well, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. But my right honourable friend is quite right the importance of our trade, growing trading relationship with Korea. Um, he'll also know as a former DCMS secretary that 71% of our services trade with Korea last year was delivered digitally. We need to upgrade the deal to make sure that it reflects a modern uh, digital trade as well, and both countries are making good progress in the negotiations. Lawrence Roberts. Question number nine, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, the Government was pleased that my honourable friend, the Prime Minister's trade envoy to Angola, Zambia and Ethiopia, and members of the Westminster Africa Business Group visited Zimbabwe on the group's inaugural trade mission. This is part of the government's work to promote opportunities for UK companies, particularly in critical minerals, renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. Boris Robertson. I'm grateful to the Minister for that response. On my visit in uh, January, when I met the President and a number of other ministers in Zimbabwe, they made it very clear that they wanted to draw a line under the past to move forward uh, and increase friendship with this country and indeed trade links. So what more can the government do to uh, enlighten companies, businesses in the UK that there are many opportunities available in Zimbabwe? Well, Mr Speaker, I thank him for his uh, report and his uh, letter to me uh, all about it. And I'm pleased with the attention and the very high level meetings he had on his recent visit and a lot of the media coverage. Uh, our embassy is following up by preparing for the Zimbabwe International Trade Fair in April uh, and expecting a strong UK presence. And I think my honourable friend's return visit in April will be a perfect chance to progress deals we have and boost British investment for this year and beyond. Number 10, please. Yeah, yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, this government is committed to pursuing environmental provisions in our trade agreements and to using our multilateral trade policy, diplomatic efforts and trade promotion activity, all of which support our green objectives. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, um, the government boasts of the trade deals it's done and the environmental protection secured, so presumably they've had a chance to analyse the impact. So could the Minister tell the House today, have the deals secured so far improved our environment, degraded the environment, and what lessons have been learned for negotiating future deals? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I think he raises an interesting uh, point, and what I can say is many of these agreements have actually, for the first time, included environmental provisions, like the Australia trade deal, which I think he didn't like, if I recall correctly, is actually the first time that Australia has committed in a trade agreement uh, to the Paris Agreement and so on. I think you'll also find, uh, to judge us on our, the impact of our trading policy over the last uh, 14 years, for example, um, in terms of imports of palm oil, which is something which is also a key interest uh, for environmentalists, 86% uh, of UK imports of palm oil are certified as sustainable, uh, up from 16% in 2010. So, again, I think, Mr Speaker, we are seeing real results of UK trade policy moving in a much more environmentally friendly direction. Lira Wills. Number 11, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, Mr Speaker, there are 130,000 children looked after in the care of close family members in, the U in England alone. We recognise the vital role kinship carers play in looking after children who can't live with their parents. Last year, the Government published the National Kinship Care Strategy and announced £20 a £20 million package of support for kinship carers in 2024-2025. Mr Speaker, the Minister just referenced the Government's kinship strategy that was published in December. And in the Government's own strategy, it recognised that kinship carers who are often in employment, who are in employment, often report the need to give up work or reduce their hours to be able to care for the children they support. And they cited kinship survey of 45% of kinship carers giving up work um, and a similar number having to reduce their hours permanently. So given the minister, given minister's desire to drive up employment and given that kinship care is stepping up overnight to look after children saves the taxpayer a huge amount of money over children going to local authority care, why aren't they making paid employment leave a statutory right and only publishing guidance? Well, she raised a very important point and we call on local authorities to be considerate of people who are in employment when they take on a child and they're looking after in a kinship care situation. We do think employers are the right people to, to deal with this in terms of making sure uh, any provision we provide is a floor, not a ceiling. There are companies like John Lewis who have a very considerate approach to people who are in this kind of situation. We urge them to do that, but also local authorities who do have budgets allocated for this particular issue to, to provide support where they can. At West, number 12, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll take question 12 and 13 together. High quality infrastructure is crucial for delivering economic growth. And if I can quote a previous Prime Minister, you and I come by road and rail, but economists travel on infrastructure. So we know how important investment is. The whole House will agree that the UK is the leading light when it comes to offshore wind farms. We're already securing investment there. And further investment, Mr Speaker, can I just quote a few? Nissan investing £2 billion in new electric car models in the UK. Microsoft and Google have announced data centres worth over £3 billion, and my Secretary of State oversaw the Global Investment Summit, unlocking £30 billion of investment. In fact, since 2010, we have secured more inward investment compared to any other country in Europe. And for the last three years, we have been the third highest in the world of the United States and China. I could go on, Mr Speaker, but I think I might test your patience. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I mean, that's all very well, but you know, the government's decision to defer the banning of, of petrol and diesel vehicles uh, to uh, 2035 has led to huge uncertainty uh, across consumers and, of course, investors, as you will well know. Uh, it seems the government lacks the ambition, certainly uh, compared to other countries, when it comes to the investment in EV infrastructure. France, for example, will have something like 400,000 installations by 2030, 50% more than the UK. So what plans does the Minister have to ensure that the UK's investment keeps up with uh, our competitors and meets the growing demand for electric vehicles? Minister. Mr Speaker, I just think, um, as the Minister for the Auto Sector, I'm very keen to ensure that we're breaking bad memes around the electric ve vehicle sector. So we're doing a huge amount of work in this space, including, well, at the moment, we have 53,600 public charge points. We have a rapid charging fund, a local electric vehicle infrastructure fund. I'm sure that his local authority would want to tap into that. DFT are working with local authorities to ensure they have local authority um, charging strategies. We have a £381 million local EV infrastructure fund which will deliver tens of thousands of more charging points and also support for on-street residential charge points too. I think it's really important that local authorities are aware of the funds that are available and I suggest that the Honourable Member gets in touch with DFT to support the installation of charging points within his constituency. Graeme Stringer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> I, I don't think any Honourable or Right Honourable member could disagree in general terms uh, with the Minister's uh, reply. It would have been more interesting, uh, a reply, if she had done an assessment of the, re <coughs> the reduction in investment since the cancellation of HS2, because there is no doubt, as she said, 
that investment in rail infrastructure leads to business investment all along the route. You can see that in Birmingham, you can see that in uh, Manchester, Mr Speaker, and you can now see the lack of uh, new investment because of the cancellation. Wasn't it a mistake? really to swap that investment which would lead to many new high technology jobs uh, to just simply replace money taken from local government to fill potholes in. Thank Minister. you. Mr. Speaker, in the previous response, I wanted just to expose the opportunities and the grants that were available to ensure that charging points are crisscrossing the country. Often, parliamentarians aren't aware of all the great work that we are doing. On the HS2 point, it was only announced just last week the extra support that's going to be made available for local transport plans that cover everything from rail, road, even dealing with issues around buses and, of course, potholes as well. And network rail. In it, at the moment, in this government, has £36 billion to improve its transport in every region of the, the UK. And just last week, an extra £4.7 billion of additional funding for local transport authorities in the North and Midlands as well. We want to make sure that decisions on transport are made locally and that they are needed and wanted by local communities, which is why we're making sure that these funds from HS2 are being made available. Christine Jarvie. Number 14, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> well, we are hacking through the red tape, not least through our Smarter Regulation Programme, where we have announced reforms, including through employment law, including through the requirements of the Working Time Directive, including the recording requirements, which will save UK businesses up to £1 billion, particularly benefiting SMEs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister, and I noticed that he welcomed yesterday's um, budget as helping small businesses, particularly the hospitality sector, which in my constituency of Edinburgh West is very hard hit. But one of the problems that lots of businesses tell us about is the business rate system. More businesses have failed in the past two and a half years than have been established. And in Scotland, we very often find that while the downsides of this government's policy are happily passed on by the Scottish Government, any benefits are not. And what we would like to see is a complete reform of the rating system, not tinkering, but reform. So can the Minister tell us if there is any uh, widespread reform planned, how he would plan to do it, and how businesses in Scotland could also benefit? Minister. Okay, thank you for your question. It's absolutely right to point to some of the difficulties in the hospitality sector. My constituency, and I, I speak to hospitality entrepreneurs right across the country who are finding difficulties, she's right. That's why we stepped in first with a package of about £13 billion of rate, business rate support. Last autumn, £4.3 billion of business rate support. We passed the equivalent monies on to the Scottish Government to pass on to the hospitality venues. They pass on none of it. None of it. A uh, typical pub in Scotland is £15,000 worse off than one in, in England, a guest house 30000 worse off, and that's why in Scotland 30% 30, 30 higher failure rate than in England, and Labour similarly in Wales, Labour government, uh, si typical pub £6,000 worse off, typical guest house uh, £12,000 worse off, and 19% higher failure rates. It is absolutely critical we pass on this benefit to those businesses and we look for structural reform. But anybody who wants to scrap business rates needs to point out where the £22.5 billion of income is going to come from rather than simply say going to scrap it without announcing a replacement. Mr. Jim Wakeford. Um, question 15, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, since 2011, we have published 20 press releases and named around 3,200 employers who have in total repaid over £41 million in arrears um, in terms of uh, most, more recent. In round 20 of the scheme, we, we've named, renamed 3,200 employers who have repaid a total of £41 million in arrears to over 460,000 workers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Naming and shaming serves as a deterrent, but shouldn't we go further against persistent offenders? Yeah. Paying, paying the minimum wage isn't an opt-out. It's for law, which yeah, no company yeah, is yeah. above. Stronger penalties, including fines proportional to the severity of a violation to ensure that no employer can exploit their workers with impunity, would level the balance between employer and employee. So will the Minister commit to exploring these measures to safeguard the rights 
and the dignities of workers. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we know that he's right to, to point to this particular measure. We know that name and shaming is a significant deterrent against underpayments of national living wage, which we are very keen to make sure that naming continues. Uh, last, in the most recent um, uh, conclusion of this uh, the naming and shaming round, 2,800 minimum wage investigations returned more than £16.3 million pounds in arrears to over 100, 120,000 workers. The HMRC issued nearly 700 fines, totalling £13.2 million pounds to businesses. But as I say, and I think as he recognises, the naming and shaming alone is a significant deterrent, and we intend to continue doing that. Shall the Minister just yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is right. Too many employers still think they can opt out of paying the minimum wage. Earlier this week, the Low Pay Commission's report for 2023 was published and said that non-compliance appears persistent in the social care sector. They heard a range of evidence citing problems with record-keeping, exploitation of migrant workers and workers routinely not being paid for travel time. It is clear the social care sector has a real issue with the minimum wage. But when browsing through the latest naming and shaming list published by the department a couple of weeks ago, only 17 employers were classified as being within the social care sector. That is under 0.1% of the total number of employers in the sector. So what is the minister going to do to ensure that everyone working in the social care sector gets at least the minimum wage? He's right to raise this, and we do much in terms of making sure people can report anonymously underpayments of national living wage, either through HMRC or through ACAS. Really important that we do. Um, We we have labour market enforcement undertakings and orders provide provide the tools for serious cases. As of April 2022, there were 40 employees in labour market enforcement undertaking, and 18 employers have been prosecuted. The message should be loud and clear by employers: if you don't comply with the law, we will take action. John Penrose. Uh, to my delighted surprise, question 17. <laughs> well, can I thank him for his question? Uh, my officials are coordinating and leading the drafting on the roadmap. <clears throat> we'll set out the government's ambition for future smart data scheme developments across seven different sectors, and we'll publish this very shortly. John Penrose. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to hear it's coming very shortly. Uh, the, my, my honourable friend will remember that uh, I asked this question just before Christmas, and he said it would be out in January, and then we were hoping it might be coming out in ye- yesterday's otherwise excellent budget, and it wasn't. Other countries are coming up on the rails. They are trying to overtake us. The noise of their, of their sort of approaching um, herd is, is right, here, right you know, growing in our ears. Can we please move as fast as possible on this? Minister. Well, he's right to hold our feet to fire on it. We are pressing forward. We're determined to get this right, not just out quickly. I mean, you're right, he's right to say I set the ambition uh, to get it out in January, and that's put a little bit of feet, of feet to get the feet to fire in, in terms of the officials too in getting this out. Uh, the, the, I signed off the roadmap yesterday, so it should be out very, very shortly. And um, I don't quite agree with him when he says other oh, nations are hot on our heels on this particular issue. We are way ahead. Yeah. There are billions of calls in open banking every single month. And we, millions are using every single day without even knowing it. We're going to extend those opportunities to energy, to telecoms, crucially to SME finance, making that journey for SMEs to be able to get business finance far more easy. Yeah. We now come to topicals. Graham Morris. Topical number one, sir. So stay. Mr Speaker, last week I travelled to Abu Dhabi for the 13th uh, World Trade Organisation Ministerial Conference. I met counterparts uh, from many countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Canada and South Africa, along with trade representatives from the US, EU and the Gulf Cooperation Council. Alongside WTO members, we negotiated real outcomes for the UK and important agreements with our trading partners. We delivered for British business through the renewal of the e-commerce moratorium, a global agreement to avoid taxes on online transactions from emails to movies and music. Building on the momentum from MC13, we will continue to champion free, fair, open trade at every opportunity, recognising its potential to lower costs and increase prosperity both here in the UK and around the world. Very much. Thank the Minister for, for that um, statement. We are no longer constrained by European competition law. The German government is providing at least €6 billion Euro in support for its steel industry. Given the very credible plan put forward by my union, Unite the Union, to protect jobs and expand production at the, st- at the steel plant at Tor- Port, uh, sorry, Port Talbot, why is the U- UK government not investing more to create a viable future for our steel? Uh, 
Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm disappointed uh, that the Honourable Gentleman feels that we have not been investing uh, as much as we should uh, do. What we have done in Port Talbot is the biggest uh, single investment government has ever made in steel. We are turning uh, Port Talbot around. It's going to be regenerated. We are replacing uh, carbon, high carbon emitting blast furnaces with electric arc furnaces to help reduce uh, emissions, which his party and uh, all of us across the House signed up to when we made that commitment to net zero. If there are specific specific things uh, that he thinks we can do around the transition. We have a transition board to help uh, those whose jobs are not going to be uh, present for electric arc furnaces, but we have done a significant amount for Port Talbot. So John Bertingo. Uh, can I commend to my right of friend the recent paper on industrial policy by Policy Exchange and its conclusion that we should avoid entering a subsidy race and instead concentrate on broad long-term measures supporting investment right across all industries. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am grateful for my honourable friend for highlighting the policy exchange report, and I agree the UK should not enter a subsidy race with other industrial nations. We have already the Advanced Manufacturing Plan, which focuses on, of course, advanced manufacturing and the, and the, and the Chancellor's also looking at green industries, life sciences, creative industries and digital technology, areas that we know that we can grow in as well. I've already spoken about the record levels of investment we get into the UK, and just last autumn, when the Chancellor announced <laughs> full expensing, over 200 business leaders and the CBI said it was a game-changer and the single most transformative thing we could do to fire up the British economy. We will continue to be competitive and ensure that we are continuing to be the third country after the USA and China in securing inward investment and, of course, beating our European counterparts. Yeah. Shall the Secretary of State shall yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, last month, the Secretary of State said at the dispatch box that she could state explicitly that trade talks with Canada had not broken down. However, the Canadian High Commission has since contradicted this in writing, yeah. saying neither negotiations nor technical discussions with respect to any of the outstanding issues have occurred since the UK unilaterally broke them off on January 25th. Mr Speaker, I just want to know who is telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Stay. Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to expand on what I said uh, last time I was at the dispatch box on this topic. And I will repeat that our engagement with Canada on trade issues has been extensive across multiple government departments covering the FTA, cheese quotas and rules of origins. On 25th of uh, January, the UK confirmed to Canada that we would pause FTA talks on the basis that cheese access had been removed and that Canada had signalled rules of origin provisions would not be extended. This is how negotiations work. Uh, I can tell him there was a meeting on 8th of February between the Foreign Secretary and his Canadian counterpart where the cheese issue was discussed. I myself raised cheese and rules of origin directly with Canadians in Abu Dhabi last week. But what I must say to him is that chasing headlines on the basis of things that he's been told by the people we are negotiating exactly. with is not helpful exactly. to achieving the outcomes which our businesses, farmers and auto industry exactly. want to see. Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That was a lot of words to say. I believe the Canadian High Commission were correct <laughs> with the answer that they, that they gave. But can I ask you next an important question about the proposed UK carbon border adjustment mechanism? Because on this side of the House, we very much support the introduction of a UK CBAM, but we are concerned the government will do so a year after the EU, resulting in the UK potentially being flooded with carbon-intensive products that would originally be destined for Europe, including steel, cement and fertiliser. Mm. Can I ask if the government recognises this danger? And if it is, if it does so, what is their plan? Yeah. Yeah. Stay. Oh, Mr Speaker, just on the first point, if he still thinks, if he still thinks that, he, that he wants to believe Canada before the UK, that is his business, but we on this side of the House know who we're working for. We're working for British businesses. Yeah. Um, on his second point, carbon leakage is a global problem facing all countries that are ambitious in tackling climate change, and we're working with international partners on how we tackle this together. We are following developments on the EU CBAM closely, and we're engaging with the Commission to discuss technical considerations relevant to UK manufacturers. We share their concerns on carbon leakage, but we need to make sure that whatever is uh, uh, a response in the UK is something that is tailored to what the UK needs, not just copying and pasting what others are doing. Yeah. Kettering is the beating heart of the East Midlands economy, so would the Secretary of State be kind enough to facilitate a visit from her ministerial team to Ball Corporation in Burton Latimer, which is the newest, largest and most modern aluminium can manufacturing plant in Europe, and a fantastic example of the very best of successful foreign direct investment into the UK economy? Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable friend for his question and also commend uh, Burton Latimer for all that they are doing. And um, also to thank my honourable friend for what he is doing to promote inward yeah, investment. Yeah, yeah. He will know that it supported 2, 000, uh, over 2,800 jobs across the East Midlands in 2023. He has spoken to me before about the importance of the Ball Corporation to Kettering, and I'm happy to confirm that either myself or one of my ministers would be delighted to visit when diaries allow. Come to SNP spokesperson Richard Thompson. Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While well, the UK uh, government struggles to support SMEs exporting to Europe, the UK government is providing a £600 million export guarantee to INEOS so they can build the largest chemical plant in Europe in 30 years in Antwerp, in Belgium. Why can the UK government find £600 million to support that investment, but not match the £500 million that the Scottish government is investing in domestic energy transition at home? Here. Uh, Mr Speaker, what UK Export Finance does is not give the money. It provides guarantees to loans which are being provided uh, by yeah. banks. Yeah. So there's a, quite a significant distinction. We have not given that money. We are guaranteed a loan. And the reason why we provide those guarantees is because they guarantee jobs to British businesses. It's a, there's a big difference between a loan guarantee and giving money. And if you would like uh, more of an explanation on that, we're happy to provide one to you. Andrew Rosner. I'm delighted as chairman of the Switzerland All-Party Group to commend the government on the forthcoming trade arrangements, a new trade agreement with Switzerland. But would the Secretary of State please update the House on progress? Particularly, could she tell us which of the 20-plus working groups the government intends to prioritise as part of those negotiations? Well, Mr Speaker, I thank uh, my, the interest from my uh, honourable friend, who is a leading member of the Switzerland APPG. Uh, both Secretary of State and I met uh, the Swiss Trade Minister in Abu Dhabi last week. Uh, the trade talks are progressing well. We are seeking high ambition outcomes in all areas, including services and investment, mobility, digital and the environment, which aren't covered by our existing FTA. So, in short, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think there is a, a, a large number of high priority areas for us to build on the agreement we did in financial services in Bern at the end of last year to make uh, sure that this UK-Switzerland FTA uh, really takes forward the bilateral trade relationship. The fourth round of negotiations is taking place in Bern this week. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We know the impact that mandatory pay gap reporting can have in tackling low pay and in-work poverty. But there is little being, progress being made in tackling the disability pay gap as it's higher now than it was a decade ago, with disabled people earning on average £3,400 less, effectively working for 47 days for free. So when will the government introduce mandatory disability pay gap reporting, and what steps is the Secretary of State taking to close the gap? Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. She raises a significant uh, issue around ensuring that disabled people are able to access employment and uh, pay properly. We have no plans to reduce mandatory disability pay gap reporting. We have no plans to introduce disability pay gap reporting at all, unlike gender pay gap reporting, which is very simple, very binding, easy to execute. Disability pay gap reporting, like ethnicity pay gap reporting, is very complex. There are a whole range of disabilities uh, which would not be able to be easily monitored and so what I would like to work with her on is other areas where we can help improve lives for disabled people at work but we don't believe that the disability pay gap reporting is the answer. Thanks. Thank you Mr Speaker. Israel is one of the United Kingdom's most dynamic trading partners so will my right honourable friend agree with me that prioritising a free trade deal with Israel will complement the good work the government is doing to defeat the haters as part of the economic activity of public bodies bill and send an unbreakable, unmistakable message that the UK stands ready to strengthen our unbreakable friendship with Israel. Um, I thank my honourable friend for that question. He is quite right. Uh, Israel's current relationship with the UK is worth about £6.4 billion, but our FTA is a rollover from the one we had uh, in 1995 with the EU. It doesn't take into account services, it doesn't take into account digital, AI, uh, genome sequencing. There is a lot that we can do, and that is why we are working on this FTA. It is a priority for us. We have, um, as I said earlier, uh, many challenges negotiating, carrying on negotiations with a country that is at war, but we are working to overcome them. 
you, Mr Speaker. Quarter 4 2023 was the tenth quarter in a row where more British businesses closed their doors than opened up. And just yesterday, a small business owner in Twickenham contacted me to tell me his business was on the brink. So if the Secretary of State will not consider business rate reform, as my honourable friend suggested to her, what is she doing to help our small and medium-sized businesses and to st stem this tide of insolvencies? Minister. Well, she raised a very important point, and we don't shy away from the fact that things have been difficult for businesses. The COVID crisis, of course, followed by the cost of doing business crisis. That's why we stepped in to support businesses, a £4.3 billion, uh, billion pound package for rates last autumn, which has helped many businesses get through a difficult time. It's unfortunate those, that support has not been passed on in Scotland and Wales, but it certainly has in England and Wales. In England, rather, I'm very happy to meet with her to discuss her particular business, uh, business problem. Lawrence Roberts. Thank you. Because of the very large population and economic activity, Nigeria offers many opportunities for British businesses. I understand there was a recent ministerial visit to that country. I wonder if we could have a brief report of the outcome of that visit. I thank my honourable friend for his question. He is right. I signed the Enhanced Trade and Investment Partnership in Nigeria alongside my counterpart, Dr. Doris Uzoko Anita, in Nigeria on Tuesday, 13th of February uh, this year, the first of its kind in terms of the UK's trade commitments across the region. The partnership aims to remove market access barriers and promote technical cooperation in areas like financial and professional services. The UK and Nigeria have co-created a partnership that tackles issues that businesses face, and it is the first step uh, in our already strong, uh, in a significant relationship and an already strong trading partnership, which totals £6.7 billion in the 12 months of September. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, Carl Creswell, Director of Business Resilience in the Department, told the Select Committee that he personally thinks we will end up spending more money on horizon compensation overall than that one billion figure currently allocated by the Treasury. But we didn't hear anything about this in yesterday's budget. Does the Secretary of State share that view? Minister. Well, we, we've always been clear, and thank you for the question, we've always been clear that the £1 billion is not a cap. Clearly, the amount of compensation needs to be paid to, for redress to get people back where they were before this scandal took place. At the moment, we haven't, we're not nearing that £1 billion, but I think over time we will be. I say it's not a cap. If we need to raise the cap, then we will. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I understand another round of negotiations is about to start in India on our long promised trade deal. Uh, given that the original proposal was that we would complete the trade deal by Diwali, Diwali this year is the 1st of November, so will my honourable friend give us an update on negotiations and agree that we should conclude the deal by the 1st of November? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I thank him for that question. I thank him for his continual interest in us getting a high-quality uh, trade deal with India, which he has long been a passionate advocate for. Of course, the most important thing is what is in the deal rather than the date that it be delivered. So we remain in round 14, and we recently welcomed Government of India negotiators to London. The prize remains very large, Mr Speaker, with, for example, with tariffs as high as 150 per cent for whisky, 125 per cent for autos, and making sure that we get our key service sectors being able to export into a market of 1.4 billion people. Chair of the Select Committee, Liam Byrne. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State will have seen the recommendations that our committee set out this morning for ending the circus of the post office administration of the redress schemes for victims of the Horizon scandal. Now, I know, Mr Speaker, that she takes this incredibly seriously, and so I know that she will study our cross-party recommendations for the new legislation that she is about to bring before the House. But, Mr Speaker, the question for today is this. If we put all of the ongoing investigations on one side, on the basis of the facts as they are known today, does she still have full confidence in Nick Reid as the Chief Executive of the Post Office in running the redress schemes currently underway? Minister. Well, okay, thank you for his work. And I, I've taken a quick look at the report this morning, and, uh, although it was only issued this morning. And uh, all, the, all the recommendations he makes in that report 
we are either fixed or are fixing, with the assistance of the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board. We believe uh, absolutely we agree with him that we need to bring the schemes instead of the compensation schemes in house. The GLO scheme has already been delivered by the Department of Business and Trade. We believe the further compensation that will flow from our overturn of convictions, we will be overturning hundreds of convictions uh, through legislation in this House very shortly, as quickly as possible. That will, that will provide a flow of hundreds of millions of pounds of compensation to those individuals. That will be done by the Department of Business and Trade. Martin Bickers. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. As the uh, trade envoy to the Western Balkans, it, it, the issue of government-to-government -government, uh, agreements is, is frequently raised with me, and there's no doubt that if they were available, uh, more deals could be done with the Balkan countries. Could the Minister give an update on the government's position, please? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I thank my hon. Friend, uh, particularly for the brilliant work do he does as trade envoy. He covers more markets than any of our other trade envoys uh, with greater skill and dexterity. Mr Speaker, I and this department were pioneers back in 2017 in putting in place a G2G agreement with Peru for the UK to be the, the delivery partner for the 2019 Pan American Games. A great deal of business with and in Peru has resulted since. We remain open to future G2G agreements on a case-by-case -case basis, and I am happy to meet with him to discuss what specific things he has in mind would work in the Western Balkans. Stephen Kidder. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have repeatedly asked Ministers whether any strings were attached to the £500 million of taxpayers' money that was given to Tata Steel, particularly with regard to job guarantees. I have not had a straight answer, so I will try again today. Can the Secretary of State please confirm whether any conditionality was attached to the £500 million, or did the Government simply buy the bluff from Tata Steel about closure and give £500 million so that we could make 2,800 people redundant? Uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Friend knows, because he attends the Transition Board meetings, that, he, that his question it is not really relevant. What he is trying to get to the bottom of is the fact that we have provided £500 million to ensure that steelmaking continues in Port Talbot. Tata made it very clear that it was uneconomic and also unsustainable to continue with steelmaking. So the support that we have given will ensure that thousands, north of 5,000 jobs, will continue in Port Talbot and, and also support the supply chains as well. On top of this, there's £100 million provided at the Transition Board, where members like himself, the unions and all the local representatives can ensure the support that is needed locally to the people that will need to go through to a transition will get the support that they need. That's £100 million on top of the £500 million, Mr Speaker. Without that support, there would not have been any steelmaking in the future at Port Talbot. Very sure. Mr Speaker, will the Secretary of State wake up to the huge potential that universities have to tackle all the problems that we have in society, including climate change, which comes to Huddersfield, which is one of the best universities in the country for working with local businesses to make the future safe for our country. <laughs> um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. If he sends a proposal to my office about what we could do on a visit to the University of Huddersfield, I'd be very, very uh, keen to, uh, to take a look. We do support our universities, and uh, if he has a specific business and trade angle in particular, we will see what we can do if diaries allow. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Hussein from East Devon, who I represent, has effectively been robbed of £100,000, given that £40,000 of substandard, work, uh, substandard building work is having to be levelled and destroyed. The Federation of Master Builders has campaigned for a compulsory licence scheme for construction companies. The Domestic Building Works Consumer Protection Bill would outlaw cowboy builders, provide compensation for consumers, and would ensure reputable builders are not undercut by unlicensed roads. Can the Minister please take a fresh look at this proposed bill? Mr. Richard. Well, can I thank you for this question? Here is a very important point. It's one of the most, uh, the, uh, the most frequent correspondences I get from colleagues across this House in terms of rogue builders. We keep, we're determined to try and make sure that this doesn't happen to our constituents. We advise them to use builders that were registered with Trustmark, which is a, uh, a trusted mark in terms of making sure that work is done properly. Very happy to meet him to discuss his potential legislation. Kirsten Olsen. Goldman Sachs found that Brexit Britain has significantly underperformed compared to other advanced economies, resulting in GDP in the UK being 5% lower than it would have been if we had not left the EU. 
Does the Secretary of State appreciate that the best way in reality to grow the economy, boost business confidence and reduce trade barriers is by rejoining the European Union? Uh, I would recommend to the Honourable Lady that she reads the uh, report which my department produced uh, the 31st of January about the benefits of Brexit, and that explains exactly what is happening with the UK economy, claiming that the figures uh, for GDP would have increased by 5% when we're outperforming our G7 partners is simply not credible, and the fact that she wants to take us back to square one is exactly the reason why people need to stick with the plan that Conservatives have. Final question, Jim Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm very, very uh, encouraged by the Secretary of State's comments about the free trade uh, deal with Israel. The UK is a friend of Israel. Israel is a friend of the UK. Uh, so, what can we do more to increase trade together? And more importantly, uh, if I can say this very, very regionally, how can the Secretary of State ensure that Northern Ireland can be very much part of that, of that uh, trade deal so that our companies in Strangford and across Northern Ireland can also feel the benefit? Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman will remember we had the Northern Ireland Investment Summit where we talked about bringing more investment into, uh, into Northern Ireland. He will know around 500 Israeli firms operate in the United Kingdom. That investment from overseas is creating thousands of jobs in high value sectors, and an FTA will help to incre increase the investment that we see, and that will benefit businesses in Northern Ireland too. That completes the questions. We'll let the front benches change over. Right, we now come to business questions. I call the Shadley of the House, Lucy Powell. If the Leader will give us the forthcoming business. Leader. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The business for the week commencing the 11th of March will include, on Monday the 11th of March, continuation of the budget debate. On Tuesday the 12th of March, conclusion of the budget debate. On Wednesday the 13th of March, consideration of an allocation of time motion, followed by all stages of the National Insurance Contribution Reduction in Rates No. 2 Bill. Thursday, the 14th of March, Estimates Day. There will be debates on estimates relating to the Department for Education, insofar as it relates to special educational needs and disabilities provision, and the Home Office, insofar as it relates to asylum and migration. At 5 p.m., the House will be asked to agree all outstanding estimates. Friday, the 15th of March, private members' bills. The provisional business for the week commencing the 18th of March includes proceedings on the supply and appropriation anticipation and adjustments bill, followed by consideration of Lords' amendments to the safety of Rwanda asylum and immigration bill. Tuesday, the 19th of March, remaining stages of the Trade Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership bill, Lords. And further business will be announced in the usual way. Lucy yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this week, the Science Secretary made a grovelling apology and retracted baseless allegations she made against a member of her own advisory body on her own personal Twitter account based on a dodgy dossier produced by a Conservative think tank. Remarkably, the damages paid out came from taxpayers' money from her department. This is a new low for ministerial standards. So perhaps the leader can clarify a few things. Was the £15,000 paid in damages the total cost borne by the science department? Apparently, she was given appropriate advice, but did she follow that advice or were her accusations against the advice she received? Because if so, then surely she should personally pay the costs. Will the Leader urgently ensure the Secretary of State is accountable to Parliament? They can't have it both ways. If the money was paid by taxpayers because it related to her ministerial responsibilities, then she must come to Parliament as a Minister and account for that. Other Ministers were told their own Twitter accounts were a matter for them personally. Does the Science Secretary still have the confidence of the Leader? Mr Speaker, all we got from yesterday's budget was old news briefed and leaked to the papers before it was given to Parliament. 
The next time the leader cries crocodile tears for the rights of this place, she could reflect on their failure to stand by parliamentary convention and deliver budgets here first. Although I'm sure the leader was relieved that her marginal constituency didn't get a name check because her colleagues were all complaining this was the kiss of death. But on the substance, the verdict is now in. The OBR forecasts tax receipts as a proportion of GDP are set to rise to their highest level since the Second World War. The Resolution Foundation says the big, big picture has not changed. Taxes are heading up, and this will be the first Parliament in modern history in which living standards fall lower than at the end than they were at the start. The Institute for Fiscal Studies agrees households are worse off since the last election. And no sooner had the Chancellor sat down than the Energy Minister criticised a key plank of the energy plans on Twitter. The public's verdict is also in. A snap poll revealed three in five voters think the government's plan is not working. The Sky News panel of 2019 Tory voters couldn't be more damning. Absolutely farcical, said one. They've got no plan, said another, who thought the budget was a great vote loser. A waste of time, and it's time for them to go, said a third. And that's because, on the big issues, this budget changes nothing. On taxes, for every 5p the government is giving, they are taking 10p in tax rises. Millions more middle-income families are paying more and more tax on their earnings, dragged into higher tax thresholds. Taxes going up to their highest level in 70 years. They hate it, but that's the reality, and that's the truth of this Conservative government. On the public finances, borrowing has been revised up, with the Chancellor's measures in the budget adding £4 billion to borrowing, with debt as a share of GDP at its highest level since the 1960s, borrowing to fund tax cuts. How irresponsible. On growth, after everything he announced was taken into account, growth forecasts were revised down from November. Growth figures would have been even worse were it not for higher predictions of net migration. They hate that too, but that's the truth. We are in a recession with the economy smaller than when the Prime Minister entered Downing Street, the biggest fall in living standards since records began, and real incomes below what they were at the last election. That's their record, and it's got the Prime Minister's name written all over it. Finally, Mr Speaker, disgracefully, there was no mention at all by the Chancellor of infected blood compensation or horizon scandal redress. The slowness in righting these wrongs is raised here most weeks. The Business and Trade Select Committee's highly critical report out this morning calls for a legally binding timetable to deliver redress to sub-postmasters, taking it completely out of the hands of the post office. Does she agree? Given everything the leader has said on both these injustices, does she understand the anger that no new money has been allocated or a timetable given for these compensation schemes in yesterday's budget. Like with other measures, wasn't this omission just another short-term, cynical act, storing up problems for the next government to sort out? As ever, it's party before country, the final acts of a desperate, dying government. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, can I start by just noting that tomorrow is International Women's Day. And I would point out that on most Thursdays, the primary players uh, in this session are three women and sometimes a fourth in uh, Speaker's chair. It is sometimes noted that in meetings, women are often the last to speak. But I would argue that while that might be true, it is also equally the case that we are often the first to set the right tone and approach. Politics needs more of us, and I hope that the spirit of tomorrow will carry into this important uh, political year. Um, turning to what the Honourable Lady has said about uh, another female colleague of ours, uh, she will no doubt be able to obtain details from the Department in some of the questions that she has raised. But I would just remind the House, because what the Honourable Lady says gets, uh, is really probing the character of uh, that Secretary of State. And I would remind this House that when the Honourable Lady was entitled to redundancy payments from uh, being a Secretary of State, uh, she did not 
uh, which was £16,000. She did not take that and handed it back to the department because it was the right thing to do. So I would just remind people of that, and I think that speaks volumes about the Honourable Lady's character and how much she values uh, the fact that it is taxpayers' money that we are talking about. Um, the Honourable Lady is channelling Elmer Fudd this morning, I see. Um, bugs may not have been in the uh, Chancellor's hat, but uh, support for businesses large and small was, help for households was, tax cuts for working people was, help for single earner families was, and holding down the price of fuel at the pump through free, another fuel duty freeze was. And we will ensure that that benefit is handed on to the uh, consumer via pump watch. I'm not going to take any lectures from a Labour Party on stewardship of public services and getting growth into our economy. No lectures on tax cutting from a Labour Party that still has £28 billion of unfunded spending commitments which can only be uh, delivered through tax rises in its plans. It was the Labour Party that left office with £71 billion uh, in a black hole in the defence budget and equipment programme. It was Labour that brought in the fuel duty escalator and is clobbering the motorist in Wales and in London. It is the Labour Party in Wales that have cut the NHS budget, not once but three times, in contrast to the increases we have brought in and the further six billion announced yesterday. And it's Labour's NHS budget cuts is one reason why a quarter of the population in Wales are on a waiting list. I'm not going to take any lectures from Labour on council tax, which rose by 104% under their administration, and again in Labour has nearly tripled since they've been in power. While we reform welfare to make work pay, double the personal allowance, cut national insurance, and have projected jobs and livelihoods through furlough, Labour think it's a good use of taxpayers' money to give asylum seekers uh, £1,600 a month. And I'm not going to take any lectures uh, from the Labour Party on supporting those earning least from a party that brought in the 10p rate. The Honourable Lady's rhetoric on growth and modernising our nation does not match her party's agenda to unpick 40 years of trade union reform, tie business in red tape, or sit well with their voting record on minimum service levels for the British public. Nor am I going to take any lectures from a party that did the square root of diddly squat for victims of infected blood uh, and the post office. And on that precise point, the Honourable Lady clearly hasn't read the Red Book. Um, just on the Horizon scandal on page 24, uh, it commits us to paying uh, full compensation. The estimates are in there, but it also says it will be increased uh, if needed. Um, this is, a, this is a tough shift. Post-pandemic and mid-war, it is a tough shift, but thank God it is our shift. Our country has turned a corner, and we are going to get back to our inflation target sooner, uh, as the new forecasts indicate. The plan is working, and we are going to stay that course, and we must. Otherwise, we are going to end up back where Labour brought us to. Compared to today, that is a million more workless households, 400,000 more children and 200,000 more pensioners in absolute poverty. Poverty, 4 million fewer in work, youth unemployment at 45 per cent, literacy rates trailing rather than leading the world, and a third less spending on the NHS. No thank you, Shadow Leader. We are going to stick with the Prime Minister's plan. Further business will be announced. Thank you. James Daly. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Mayor of Greater Manchester, the Mayor of Greater Manchester's vanity project the 493 square mile clean air zone has cost the taxpayer nearly a hundred million pounds a hundred million pounds supported by all Labour councillors in Greater Manchester and all Labour councillors in Bury. Would my right honourable friend make time for a debate to ensure that the voice of Conservative MPs who have campaigned against this ridiculous project can be heard again and that this tax on hard working people never sees the light of day? Leader of the House. Well, can I congratulate my honourable friend who has been um, uh, leading the charge uh, on this uh, matter? Um, there is a, a, although there is a legal obligation to achieve compliance with um, uh, emissions in the, in the shortest possible time, um, we are reviewing that. Uh, and he also will know that um, uh, Greater Manchester authorities are now. Um, Changed their tune and uh, are proposing an entirely different approach. I think that 
the campaign that he has run and the support that he has galvanised amongst his communities is the reason why that is being done, and I would congratulate uh, him and encourage him to hold uh, them to account. SNP spokesperson Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, following the frankly appalling behaviour of the leadership of the Labour Party in disrupting the SNP's Opposition Day debate on the 21st of February... don't like the truth, obviously. The Leader told the House that she was sympathetic not only to the idea that the SNP should get another Opposition Day debate, but also that it should be taken from the allocation given to the Labour Party. I just wonder if she could update the House on how her thinking has developed on those points. Uh, further to that, uh, Mr Speaker, I would like to address the issue of ministerial responsibility. So yesterday it was revealed that uh, the Conservatives have a branch manager in Holyrood and also an energy minister in government, neither of whom appear to support this, party's, this government's energy policy. So can the Leader uh, confirm does the principle of collective responsibility in government also apply to junior ministers? And if so, what advice would you give to any ministers who is unable to support such a key plank of government policy, either publicly or in any budget votes ahead? Now, finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology has uh, cost the taxpayer £15,000 after falsely accusing an academic of supporting Hamas. So, could we have a debate on the limits of privilege and specifically whether it is now the policy of the government that ministers can say whatever they like outside of Parliament and they will be financially indemnified from the consequences of doing so with the taxpayer? And whether she considers that it is now the job of the taxpayer to underwrite financially the Conservative Party's culture wars whenever they overstep the mark? Leader. Uh, well, can I thank the honourable gentleman for his questions? Um, with regard to uh, future opposition day debates, he knows that, uh, and I've spoken to the leader of his party in Westminster regarding this, that we will give more time to the SNP. I think that they were badly treated, and we will make that right. As I have explained, I also want to ensure that the procedure committee looks at what happened, because I do not want minority parties to receive uh, more time on the floor of this House, but be in any doubt uh, about how those debates will be conducted. I understand Mr Speaker has written to the Procedure Committee just to ask them to do a quick piece of work, um, and I will announce future Opposition Day debates uh, for the SNP, uh, and I hope that they will have confidence in what the Procedure Committee says in, in going uh, forward. Uh, with regard to the issues he uh, raises about particular measures uh, in the budget, uh, we have a balanced budget. That is why the Chancellor has made the decisions uh, that he had. It is the, the uh, government's budget and the government's plan, but I think it is rather, uh, rather um, cheeky of the honourable gentleman to uh, seek to lecture us about uh, use of uh, public funds. I refer him to what I said about the Secretary of State for Science earlier on. Um, I had, uh, I mean, the, the SNP are legendary in this uh, respect. I had wrongly assumed actually that the appalling Willy Wonka experience in Glasgow had been laid on by the SNP, given its high cost, <laughs> poor return, and the fact that the police were called. But, however, the presence of a bouncy castle um, put uh, pay to, to that uh, theory, given that bouncy castles have been banned by the SNP local <laughs> authorities on health and safety grounds. Very Bradley. Mr Speaker, the lives of people across North Staffordshire have been blighted for far too long by the stench coming off Wally's Quarry landfill site in Newcastle under Lyme. Um, there's delight that the Environment Agency has now issued a suspension notice. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to our honourable friend from Newcastle under Lyme for the work he has done on this incredibly yeah, yeah, important yeah. issue? And given, Mr Speaker, I know this is an issue that affects communities up and down the country, including yours, could the Leader of the House find time for a debate on the issue of landfill sites? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I Please thank that. my right honourable friend for raising this very important point? It is unacceptable that uh, residents in Newcastle under Lyme have for far too long had to put up with these appalling uh, smells emanating from uh, the, the particular quarry, and she is absolutely right to pay tribute to our honourable friend, uh, the, the honourable member for that area. He has uh, raised this many times in this House. He has been fighting for his uh, constituents. I think he secured two Westminster Hall debates on this uh, matter, um, and it is uh, in very great part uh, down to his efforts this is being resolved. Right, Mr. Chair, Ian Burns. 
very grateful, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Chair of the Procedure Committee for a very timely and affirmative response to our request to examine uh, Westminster Hall standing orders? Um, and, and I, I think um, so to that end, uh, Mr Speaker, I've actually written to the Leader, leader of the House this morning and hope, hopefully we'll get a similarly timely and affirmative response from, from the Leader of the House on, on that particular um, instance. Um, we would, of course, as, as a committee, welcome applications for debates um, uh, uh, from members across the House, and, and particularly for Westminster Hall, um, where we would probably be able to facilitate um, members with debates in, in, the, in the aftermath of the Easter recess. I think until re Easter recess, we're, we're, we're pretty well booked up, but uh, that, that's as far as I need to go this morning, Mr Speaker. Well, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman again for his very helpful ad advert for his committee. He knows that I very much agree with uh, both his ask and the advice of the Procedure Committee, and so we will make this very good innovation uh, the case very swiftly. Can we have a debate on defending the environment and quality of life in the London suburbs? TfL and its development partner, Ballymore, want to build 25 tower blocks in Edgware Town Centre including a 29-storey skyscraper. This is completely unacceptable and inappropriate. The Mayor of London must demand that TfL withdraws from this project, and we need a debate to make that point to him. Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for raising this? It's, it's clear all communities want to ensure we have uh, new homes being built. That is very important. But we've got to make sure that they are uh, of the right type, uh, that they're not affecting the character of a particular uh, area and the needs of local people and their views are, are taken into account. I know the Honourable Lady has been campaigning very hard against uh, these matters and uh, that development really does need to be uh, more gentle in the density uh, that is being suggested for it to be in keeping with the local character. Can I congratulate her and the uh, Save Edgware campaign, which uh, uh, is uh, absolutely working uh, flat out to ensure uh, that uh, the, the character of that community uh, can remain, and I stand ready to assist her uh, as she progresses that campaign. Bill Ribeiro Abbey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, the 9th of March, March marks 10 years since the death of my dear friend Adra Annan. She was just 28 years old. Adra had sickle cell anemia, the UK's fastest growing genetic condition, but her untimely death was actually the direct result of serious failings in her care. Her experience and those of many others are outlined in the landmark Sickle Cell Society and APPG report, No One's Listening. However, since its publication in 2021, the government has failed to meaningfully engage with its findings and recommendations. Mr Speaker, it cannot be right that 10 years after we lost Adra, those with sickle cell and thalassemia continue to experience inequalities in treatment, substandard care and avoidable deaths. So I want to ask the Leader of the House when we can expect the Government to finally listen and put forward policy that implements in full the recommendations of the No One's Listening report. Well, can I start by thanking the Honourable Lady for uh, remembering her friend Adra and allowing us all uh, to pause and pay tribute to her, her friend and, uh, and thank her also for raising the important work that the APPG did on this matter. The next health questions is not uh, until later April, so I will write on the Honourable Lady's behalf to the Secretary of State for Health and ask her to respond directly to the Honourable Lady. Ian Little Granger. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I wonder if we could have a debate in <coughs> government time. It would be nice to actually talk about Mid-Devon. I've talked about it before, I know. But it's now got to be on the joke. There is no planning enforcement in Mid-Devon now. They've all gone. It is a free-for-all for developers. But second, much more importantly, they've gone to three-weekly um, waste collection, which isn't a problem, except it's been totally taken over by a sort of draconian 1984 group of councillors who are determined to make the lives of the people of Tiverton and Mid-Devon impossible. The Chair of Scrutiny, who I think is now incompetent and lazy, is doing nothing to scrutinise any of this. We can't have local government being run by people who seem to be out to actually make the lives of local people miserable. Therefore, could we please have time to have a debate on local government in the future? Well, it is sometimes said uh, in response to questions that uh, I 
refer the uh, honourable member to the, the answer I gave some moments ago. I think the honourable gentleman could just stand up every week and, se- and refer me to the question that he asked last week. He is assiduous in his campaigning to highlight the failures of his local authority, uh, and I expect to see him next week doing exactly the same thing. We're a hobos. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Passengers must feel confident when making train journeys. In the last two weeks alone, there were major cancellations on South Western trains and mass delays on Southern Rail and Tam- Thameslink. At the same time, rail fares rose by nearly 5% on Sunday. Everybody is paying more for less. Is it not high time we have a debate in government time on how we can support our crumbling rail infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, the Honourable Lady will know that the Department has made recent announcements on quite considerable uplifts to rail infrastructure. Um, I know that there have been particular issues with South West trains with regard to the service that they're putting on and also the quality of uh, their rolling stock. Um, The next question session with the uh, Secretary of State is not uh, uh, for some time, so I will, whip, on the Honourable Lady's behalf, raise her concerns with him and ask that uh, officials from his office get in touch. Okay. Dr. Matthew Wall. Mr. Speaker, the RAF Museum in Collindale is one of London's premier tourist attractions, and many who visit do so by using the tube. However, TfL and the Mayor of London have decided that the works to upgrade Collindale tube station necessitate a six month closure. This would be dire not only for commuters but also for visitors to the RAF Museum. Can we have a minister come to the dispatch box to talk uh, about what uh, they can do to advise the assistance that can be provided to mitigate yet more unintended consequences from the disastrous mayor? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this very important point? It is an amazing museum. I was recently there at the RAF uh, Gallantry um, uh, Awards dinner, and uh, I think that at most times this would be a very unfortunate thing to be happening to one of our most uh, impressive uh, national museums. But I think in this year there are particular anniversaries that are coming up, which mean that people will want to uh, visit that and particularly look at reconnaissance aircraft and so forth that are, that are there. Um, he will know that um, this is a matter that is devolved to the, the Mayor of London, but I know um, that he has done a service by getting concerns of many people on record today, uh, and I shall also make sure that the relevant departments have also heard his concerns to see what pressure can be brought to bear on uh, Transport for London and the Mayor of London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The budget means net tax cuts of nine billion taking effect in an election year, but this is dwarfed by twenty-seven billion pounds of tax increases that have taken effect last year, and nineteen billion tax rises which will come into effect after the general election because of the actions of her party. The Chancellor has given with one hand, taken with the other. Does the Leader of the House think her party is fooling anyone? Well, she will know, and I would encourage her to reread the Chancellor's speech yesterday uh, as to how, what progress we are making, both in terms of growth, inward investment into this country. This year, uh, the Investment Summit had a record amount of money being uh, put into this nation, 30, over £30 billion pounds just uh, garnered in that particular week. And she will know that we had revised forecasts yesterday in terms of us cut, returning to our Uh, target for uh, inflation. These are tough times, but the plan is working, uh, and we are determined to see hard-working families through it. Bob Black. Before the pandemic, TfL's finances were in a complete mess because the Labour Mayor of London refused to raise fares in line with inflation. Now, after receiving the final instalment of the £6.2 billion of of coverage for under Covid from the government, he freezes fares again refuses to pay the police the money they need to reform and keep London safe, and raises the council tax precept by 8.7%. So could my right hon. Friend arrange for time for a debate so that we can point out the errors of the London Mayor and put us on the course for proper governance in London? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for again raising the appalling maladministration of the, the Mayor of London. Londoners are paying more 
uh, to uh, prop up the mayor's budget, uh, not just in the, uh, the increased headline rates, but also in a whole series of stealth taxes and fines that are being levied. Uh, but even the most fundamental services, uh, being the police, for example, in, uh, in London, have an enormous black hole in their budgets. It's an absolute scandal, and I hope that Londoners will rectify that situation in the coming months. Andrew MacDonald. Yeah. The sorry saga of Teesworks continues, including the mysterious £20 million paid out to the joint venture partners over rubble, and putting to one side the levelling up secretary's bizarre hailing of Lord Auchins as, the, as Teesside's best champion since <laughs> Sunderland won the FA Cup in 1973. <laughs> Whilst she might want to send a colleague a map of the North East, could she prevail upon him to come to the House and make a statement and explain how his comment that with £560 million of public money so far invested, providing eye-watering incomes for the joint venture partners without putting in any money of their own, is in any way consistent with his claim that the remediation of the site was achieved by bringing in private investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There hasn't been any such private investment. The taxpayer has paid for the lot. So could the leader please ask the Secretary of State to come to the House and explain himself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I would dispute the, uh, what the Honourable Gentleman says, um, and I think it goes to the heart of uh, his uh, prejudices against private sector involvement. I would say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The employment rate in Teesside is now 3% over the national average. And uh, I'm sorry the Honourable Gentleman doesn't welcome that success. We do, uh, and we want it to continue. Andrew Rossen. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Sir. The Leader of the House will be fully aware that I welcome the Prime Minister's remarks outside No. 10 Downing Street last week when he said that it's not enough to live side by side. We must live together, united by a shared commitment to this country. He's right. Immigration is only successful when integration is successful. So, in light of that, will the Leader of the House agree to a debate on the floor of the House concerning a new proactive integration strategy, ensuring that those who come to Britain are encouraged to learn English, become part of UK communities and embrace British values. Does she agree that we need a coherent UK integration policy? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this very important point? I know that the Home Office uh, have done work uh, in this area, and he will know that there have been uh, previous initiatives by other departments, such as the Department for Leveling Up, in terms of providing language classes uh, and so forth. I think also the Home Office have been focused on those that have uh, leave to remain here and choose to make their home here, um, but are not citizens um, of uh, this country, and looking at actually whether we need a more uh, um, robust and more proactive uh, stance towards citizenship and, and all the things that it brings and all the things that it means to us. No case. Despite my Airdrie and Shots constituent John being born in North Lanarkshire and living in Scotland his whole life, he had to apply to become a British citizen, pledge his allegiance to the King and pay £260 for the process of applying for a passport because he doesn't have access to his mother's birth certificate. Will the Leader of the House make way in government time for MPs to raise and debate various passport issues? Can she outline if she's aware of any recourse for my constituent to be Reimbursed. Well, I would be very happy to facilitate for the Honourable Lady a meeting between Home Office officials uh, and her office, or indeed herself, to talk about this case in particular, and also anything that the Department can learn from uh, uh, John's uh, experiences of going through this process. He will know that we have um, clear line of sight reporting on the costs that are charged for particular things, but if uh, there has been some injustice in this respect, I'm sure that meeting will help rectify the situation. Robert Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week saw the launch of the independent report that I, uh, uh, together with the uh, DWP and the leading research charity Autistica, prepared as a result of a 10-month review into autism and employment. There is still a huge gap 
uh, in terms of the number of people uh, in work. Under one, uh, three in ten uh, adults uh, who are autistic are working. That is way below the disability average. I'm grateful to the Backbench Business Committee for allocating time for a debate here in the Chamber on the report and its findings in April. Will my right honourable friend use her good offices to ensure that that time is uh, preserved as much as possible and that uh, colleagues from across the House can uh, uh, debate the important recommendations raised in my report. Well, can I first of all thank my right honourable friend for all the work that he has done uh, on, on this particular report, but on many other uh, areas that are of deep concern to uh, people with autism uh, and their families. Uh, this is a, a landmark report. It is wonderful to hear that it is being debated uh, on the floor of the House. I will ensure that that uh, time is protected and that nothing uh, happens to it. Uh, and I would also congratulate my uh, colleagues at the Department for Work and Pensions uh, for the work that they have done and the proactive way they have commissioned these, these findings. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday after the budget, Kate Burke, the Chief Executive of the Haemophilia Society, said this. Today, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt could have reassured those infected and affected by contaminated blood products that resources for long overdue compensation would be made available. Instead, like so many chancellors before him, he ignored this issue deepening the anxiety, anger and frustration caused by his government's failure to take responsibility for this long-running injustice. We deplore this cowardly and morally bankrupt attempt to kick the payment of compensation beyond the next general election. I know the leader cares very deeply about this issue and she will be as disappointed as I am about the failure to put anything into the budget. Can we please now have a statement from the Paymaster General as to exactly what he is doing? He's not talking to those infected or affected. He's not taking soundings from any of the campaign groups. He's appointing people and we're not allowed to know their names to advise him. It's time for a statement. It's time to know what the government is actually doing. Yeah. Well, can I thank the Honourable Lady again for raising this important point? And uh, I am very happy to set the record straight on this. Um, it is not the intention to uh, kick the can down the road on this. Uh, the Paymaster General uh, and I have a weekly update on this. He is working very hard. I know the Honourable Lady will appreciate that this is, throughout all of this process, this is the hardest uh, bit to actually come up with the scheme uh, in, in short order and ensure that it is going to deliver for those infected and affected by this matter. I think that the House will not have to wait long before it is updated by the Paymaster General. And I already know uh, that he is planning a tour uh, across the UK to meet with particular groups, and I hope that he will be able to update the Honourable Lady on that uh, very swiftly. This is a, a moral issue. We have taken it seriously. That is why we did the inquiry. That is why we did the compensation review. And I know that the Paymaster General will have to balance uh, the, the issues that the Honourable Lady raises against being swift on this matter. He feels it very deeply uh, and he will deliver for this House and all of those victims. Sir Michael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tomorrow is International Women's Day and today marks five months since the barbaric Hamas attack on Israel. Of the 134 hostages still cruelly held by Hamas, 19 are women and of those, five are teenage girls. Now, will my right honourable friend join me in marking International Women's Day by supporting the campaign that's called hashtag Bring Back Our Girls? And will she take this opportunity to send a message to their families who are enduring unimaginable pain and the living nightmare of young women in the hands of vicious rapist terrorists? Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for affording the whole House the opportunity to send a message to the families of, of uh, all the hostage families that they are still very much in our thoughts. Of those women and girls still kept uh, hostage, the youngest is 19, the, the oldest is 70. 
and we can only imagine the, the horrors that they are facing. This week, the UN published their report on the sexual violence suffered by Israeli women and girls on the 7th of October. They looked at over 5,000 photographs and over 50 hours of footage of those attacks, and they concluded that there was evidence at the Nova Music Festival of rape, gang rape, uh, and murder. Uh, it is the most appalling situation. I'm glad that the UN now have that evidence on record and have produced that report. We cannot uh, let these uh, poor women and girls uh, suffer what they must be suffering uh, a, a moment longer. We must bring them home, and I'm sure that is the sentiments of everyone in this House. Ashley Dalton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, constituents uh, in West Lancashire have this week been deeply concerned about the threatened closure of our dial ride service. Uh, yesterday I learned that unlike Conservative-led Lancashire County Council, Labour-led West Lancashire Borough Council has managed to find some additional funds for this year, um, and dial ride has announced that it will be able to continue uh, for the following financial year. Could we please have a debate about the impact of over a decade of cuts to local government on the valuable yeah. community and voluntary sector that all our constituents rely upon? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the voluntary and community 